and thank you for this day that you've given us. Lord, we thank you for this beautiful weather, Lord, and, and uh, that, that you've provided for us. But Lord, we thank you for the people that have showed up here this morning and those that are watching online. Father, we know that your word will not return void, and we pray, Lord, that, that lives are changed, that believers are drawn closer to you, Lord, and that those that are lost, Lord, just come to the saving knowledge of you. Father, we ask now that you go with us and that you guide and direct us, and we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen.
give you all the honor and glory you so deserve. But Lord, we ask this morning that you soften our hearts. You get us ready for communion. But more importantly, get us ready for the message that you have prepared for us today. For it's in Jesus' name we pray. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen.
house and gather together to worship and leave, leave him to what we can give back to him. You know, there's so many places in this world, as I was praying earlier with Wayne on the way here, that they can't do this. But he allows us to be here today. So let's give it back to him today, amen? Yeah. If you're visiting with us today, there's a welcome card on the back. If you would mind, fill it out for us. Put it in the box that's back there. That way we can know you, love you, and serve you. Prefer not to do that, just go to graftwithbc.com. Go there and put it on there so that way we can know who was here. Also, there's some prayer cards back there. And if you do it online as well, just let us know if you have a prayer and or praise. So that way we can be praying with you and just lift him up and give him all the glory for everything. For now Ms. Deb wants to speak real quick. Not Ms. Tootsie. Ms. Deb? No, ma'am. Over here. You're on camera. We're online, so you have to be over here now. short people leaning, you better get up on the stage because I guarantee you, everybody out there just saw like a half of your head. I'm not trying to discriminate. I'm trying to be a professional online for those folks. Am I not telling the truth, people out there? I love you too, Pastor. Yeah. Well, this morning is the Lord's Supper and that's not the way you begin the Lord's Supper. So I'm seeing some really great, look at those eyes. I see Miss Cindy. I'm good to see you. We are doing the Lord's Supper this morning. As, as a family. So if you are visiting, or maybe if you're online, if you believe that Jesus Christ is your Lord and Savior, we would love for you to partake with us. Now, I know this is unusual. We usually either have them up here ready for people to come and get, or we, we pass them out. Um, but we are trying to do our best to be a church that is uh, making sure we're not passing on any cooties to anybody or, or giving the coronavirus to anyone. So I'm going to tell you guys out here, take a moment and make sure the first layer is done so that you can get to the bread, okay? And then you can go ahead and open the second part uh, for the cup itself. Uh, because, hey, man, I tell you what, my little thumpy fingers, they are not working right. So it's, there's nothing romantic about this. There's nothing, I can't make this as into, uh, this, mm, but the Lord smiles upon us, so. We'll be back in time for all of this. The neat thing is that we can gather, folks. The neat thing is we can be here together every week. And folks, all of y'all out there uh, for our church members, we are distancing ourselves into families and everything else. Uh, please come be a part of it. You can either pull up a piece of the floor and, and just sit with a blanket as some of our kids are doing, or we got the chairs out, or bring your own chairs, okay? So come on with us. Let me just reflect for a minute in understanding where Paul was at. We're going to be reading out of 1 Corinthians. He's reminding the church that as much as the cross is a symbol of our salvation, it was actually his body that was broken for us that was more important. Because it was his body that symbolized that perfect lamb that would be sacrificed for the sins of man. And so when we partake of the bread, what we're partaking in and acknowledging in is that Christ died for the sins of man. That's what we're acknowledging. We are acknowledging that he, on the cross, in his life, he led the perfect life. He is the perfect sacrifice, the perfect forgiveness of our sins before a righteous father. That's what he is. And then as his blood is spilled, which to me is still a dramatic thing to ever think about, 
It is a, it's a representation that through his blood we are cleansed, right? Both of it, both in his body and in his blood, we are made new. It's a new covenant. The, the, the Jewish tradition would have had many cups and many ways to talk about how the Jews fell, find themselves out of captivity, out of sin, uh, out of, well, not sin, but out of slavery. We find ourselves out of slavery through the sacrifice of Christ and through his blood that was shed for us. So remember that as we're partaking. And it is a remembrance that both should be a celebration and one of humility. It is a celebration because we can be free in Christ. It is a form of humbling humiliation that we can't do it ourselves. He who know, knew no sin took our sin. We should be dying for our own sins. We should be sacrificing for our own sins, but he makes it possible that we can do it through him. And then, so it's a new covenant. And if you drink of it, if you eat of this bread and you're drinking of it, what you're saying is I acknowledge that Jesus Christ is my Savior. I acknowledge that he is the Lord of my life. And thus we don't take this lightly. It's not just a ritual. It's not something we do as a church. It is deeper. It's meaningful. It's like taking vows at a, a wedding. It's supposed to mean something. Something beautiful and deep and commitment and covenant. And it's more than that. So please don't, don't, don't just look at this as much as you look inside your heart. And, and see what this means. And so let's, let's do this together. Would you take out that little uh, piece of bread with me? Oh, Lord, yeah. I hope I can make this happen. Man, my little fingers are wondering. I have to say, and I'm going to tell you, this reminds me of my Methodist days. Because the Methodist church had these little wafers right there. So this is what uh, Paul writes. He says, for, for I received from the Lord what I also delivered to you. That the Lord Jesus, on the night when he was was portrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, this is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In like manner, he also took the cup after supper and saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. You can hear some of y'all trying to get that done back there. So. Let me pray for us this morning. Father God, if anything else, you bring us together through the sacrifice, through the life, through the death, through the resurrection, and the coming of your son Jesus Christ. I pray, Lord, today that as we just continue to worship to you and sing, that we can understand with a sense of humility that we're free to worship you. We can raise our hands. We can dance to you. We can sing to you. We are free to do so because of the body that was broken for us and the blood that was spilled to make us free and be able to celebrate you, Lord. Thank you, God, for all that you're doing in our lives. Thank you for all that you're going to do in our lives. And we just continue to worship you and give you our praise in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Will you stand with me again as we continue to worship you?
thing. Tara, my beautiful wife, does have for everyone some for kids. Does everybody on their kids got something? All right. If you adults want something to doodle with, you can too. All right. If you need a piece of paper or something to write on, you can. Hey, Kelly, come back up here, young lady. Come on. Now, come on. It's your birthday. <laughs> it's your birthday. Hey, for y'all who may have never been to Grafton, usually we celebrate people's birthdays. All right. But being that Kelly is special to me, don't get six, six feet. Six feet, sister. But you got to be in the view of the camera. Come on. Come on. She turned 21. We're excited. She is uh, of age now. Um, so we're going to sing her happy birthday. But just to kind of do this right, if it is your birthday, or if during the whole coronavirus thing has been going on to your birthday, go ahead and stand in the audience right now. Has anybody had their birthday this last? Who's back there? Charlotte. Charlotte? Scarlett? Uh, you want to come up here and be sung to? You want to come up here? Come on, girl. I promise we don't have cuties. Well, we don't really know what it is. Circle dot to the shot. Come on. Got another one. Who is it? Math? Come on, brother. Yeah, Big man, come on. Come on. How come my nephew not come up here? All right, we got, oh yeah. I remember, I came by your house. Scooch in. I'll scoot yes. over, y'all be, be in the camera and I'll get out of the camera with you. All right, we ready? God bless you, right? Happy birthday to you. Too, you know, and, and I don't know about you guys, but 
I just missed, okay, just being able to come, whether it be Sunday morning, maybe the life groups on Wednesday, but it is not what makes church, okay? Church is not about going to church. We are the church, right? We are to be the church, okay? So if we're not together, even though I don't like that, doesn't mean we stop being the church. It just means we're a little scattered, a little spread out right now. Maybe it's kind of like my waistline. It's a little larger in, in expansion, but we got to remember that we don't come to church. We are the church. We need to remember not to uh, uh, have church, but be church. And that's kind of where I'm going to go with this lesson today. It's in Mark chapter 2, and it's going to sound a little odd because it's really just the story of Jesus healing the paralytic man. But I don't know what it is. If you guys are like me, there are times when I just read something in the scripture and it goes, oh, that's exactly what, and it's just like God was giving me examples of what it means to be the church, okay? At least two primary ones. And then there's a little bit of conviction by God in, in how we're not being the church. And I'll share those as well. But look at this, uh, Mark chapter 2, verses 1 through 11. And it says this, When Jesus returned to Carpenium, several days later, the news spread quickly that he was back home. All right? Soon the house where he was staying was so packed, so packed with visitors that there was no room even outside. Well, now, so just stop there. I want y'all to remember this, all right? That this house was so packed now remember, this is back when there was no AC. None of those little church fans, you know, to wave around. So you can't imagine if this was in the dead of summer there in northern Israel. I mean, that it could have been some hot days right there. People probably falling out, not in the spirit either. All right? We're talking just falling out. So I want you to imagine some little church, hundreds of people sitting on floors and windows, everywhere else, outside just trying to hear a little bit of Jesus message, right? So get that in your head of Jesus trying to uh, have church, so to speak, and, and, and it's just packed, all right? And uh, where was I? Okay. Even outside the door. And while he was preaching God's word to them, so Jesus is preaching, four men arrived carrying a paralyzed man on a mat. They couldn't bring him in because of the crowd, so they dug a hole through the roof above his head. Then they lowered the man on his mat. Now, look, again, I'm going to stop because I'm not going to preach on these things. Don't let it pass you by. Back in the time of Christ, what they would do was they would have thatched roofs. I've heard that it could be in this part. It would actually be almost a, a wooden thatched roof that they even sometimes would put dirt on and grass would grow during the summer on it or moss or something else. They act as almost like a shingle. So they're digging their way through a man through a man's roof, all right? I'm not sure they thought all that through, but they're going to get this man to Jesus, okay? So again, if you're all out there, never heard the story, packed house, not a, it's not a church, it's a packed house, roof is starting to open up, dirt's falling down, wood's flying everywhere, and people are kind of going, oh, I guess this is the end. You know, I, I don't know what's going on, all right? So, all right, back to where we were. The, verse 4. They couldn't bring him in um, because of the crowd, so they dug a hole through the roof above his head. And then they lowered the man down on his mat, right down in front of Jesus. Seeing their faith, Jesus said to the paralyzed man, My child, your sins are forgiven. But some of the teachers of the religious law who were sitting there thought to themselves, What is he saying? This is blasphemy. Only God can forgive sins. See, remember, they don't know yet that Jesus is the Messiah, or they don't believe he is the Messiah. In fact, a lot of these religious leaders never will. So, of course, they're saying, what kind of man says he can forgive sins of another man other than God himself? This is blasphemy. This is unholy, right? And, and rightly so. If that isn't Jesus, this isn't right. Okay? So everybody would understand that. And then verse 8, Jesus knew immediately what they were thinking. So he asked them, why do you question this in your hearts? Is it easier to say to the paralyzed man, your sins are forgiven? Or stand up, pick up your mat, 
and walk. And again, this right here, not preaching on it, Jesus is saying, what's easier for me as God to do? To heal you or to die for you? What's easier? To live a life without sin? To go to a cross? To have to, you know, be buried for three days and raised? Or just look at you and say, you're healed? Of course, it's much more difficult. That there's much more sacrifice to die for someone. To conquer the grave, to die of your sins, then to just bring healing. All right? So there's a whole bunch. Can, there's ten sermons in this sucker right here. All right? So we can't get to all of them. You know, in verse 10, So I will prove to you that the Son of Man has the authority on earth to forgive sins. Then Jesus turned to the paralyzed man and said, Stand up, pick up your mat, and go home. Let me pray for us. Father God. I pray that your word would just come alive in so many different ways today. For every one of us in this room, from our children to us, to us adults, Lord, may your word just penetrate our hearts and our ears. In Jesus' name, amen. Now let me, let me tell you something. So I want you to keep in mind all that's happening. There were a whole lot of people in this story going to church this day. They're going to church. They are going to see Jesus. They're going to hear the word of God. They're kind of going. They want to see the miracles. They want the miracles to happen to them. They're going to church. But technically, only four of them is being the church. And it's the four men that bring the paralyzed man to Jesus. We say a lot, folks. And, and, and I do it. You do it. We say, hey, I'm going to church today. Some of y'all might say, hey, what, where do you go to church today? And we've got to get it out of our vocabulary. I know it's hard. And we've got to start saying, hey, do you want to celebrate with me on Sunday? Hey, you want to go to a life group or something else? But we've got to understand that we are the church, right? And we must be the church no matter if we're in our sanctuary or at a church event. We are the church. So whether you're in a grocery store, whether you're at work, whether you're at home, you are the church. Okay? And if you get nothing else out of the sermon, if you check back out, that's what I want you to hear. Be the church. Be the church no matter where you are. All right? Now, that doesn't mean I don't want you here on Sunday mornings. It doesn't mean that the pastor down the street doesn't want you at church on Sunday morning. We want to gather. We want to be the church in many ways. But the main thing is to be the church is not just on Sunday mornings for an hour. It's not at a life group or small group during the week. It is every day, every moment of your life to be the church. Okay? So let me give you a little backstory. Carpinium. This is a really kind of cool little village, a fisherman's village in the middle of northern Israel. All right? Now, if y'all didn't, y'all know this, right? Jesus was born in what city? Bethlehem. All right, I'm not going to make y'all have a Bible lesson. Bethlehem. He would be raised in Nazareth. All right? Now, this is what happens. When Jesus is baptized and goes into the wilderness for 40 days, when he comes out of that wilderness, he settled in Carpinium. It's called the Galilean years. About two years, Jesus basically makes his home in Carpinium. Some would say that he might have lived with Peter. All right, that that might have been his home. Okay, we don't really know that for a fact. Some say that the house that they're at right now could have been Peter's, Peter's mother-in-law that he heals. It, it, you know, there's a lot. I'm not going to sit here and tell you that's truth because it's not in the Bible, but it's kind of where a lot of scholars will take us. But it's just a small fishing village of about 1,500 people, and really, what's happening is there's kind of a revival taking place. That's what's happening in this little city. Many are coming because they hear of this prophet, this rabbi named Jesus, who is doing miracles like nobody's business. So this little town is being really just inundated with people, with people who got crippled, the, the demon possessed, everything else. And daily Jesus is going, he's preaching in the synagogue mainly. And then he would preach in homes, and sometimes he'd do tent ministries and go out in the countryside. When he goes out in the countryside, you can read the stories about how he heals a leper. Sermon on the Mount. All right? All those things are happening in Carpinium. That's 
that's what's happening. And at one point where it says when Jesus returned to Carpenium, in verse number one, several days later, the news spread quickly, hey, he's home. Wherever that is. And they knew where Jesus lived. All right, and so they're all gathering in his house. They are packing in. People are coming from all over the place. And in general, they're, got, they're having church. Okay? Now, I don't know if they did praise and worship or singing, you know, not to Jesus, but at least doing it. All I know is they're looking for the wow factor. <laughs> they're not just coming to hear some rabbi preach. They could go to their own rabbi or Pharisee or Sadducee to get all that. This man was different. They wanted the difference. They wanted the wow factor. Unfortunately, guys, I think that's how church has become today. I think a lot of people, I'm not saying you, I'm not saying y'all out there, but we want the wow factor of church. We want the praise band to have the lights and the, 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 the right thing in the background. We want to have all of the, the we want to have all of the atmosphere and all we want to have the wow factor. And if it ain't there, we'll find somewhere we can get it. It's a consumer-driven church. We're centralizing ourselves in every aspect of it. Now, is there anything wrong with worshiping God excellently? Absolutely not. And if you got it, get it. You can sing, get on the stage. You can play it, come on, bring it to Jesus. We have to be careful that that's not the reason you're here. Okay, because that's going to church, folks. Most people that were there with Jesus that day weren't going to church. They weren't being the church. They just go. They're going to hear something. They're going to experience something. They're not there to be the church. And Jesus knows that. He's frustrated with that. And this is what I want you to remember as being the church. Number one, all right? Aaron, I think, yeah. Here we go. To be the church, we need to remember our brokenness. Number one, you want to be the church? Never forget where you came from. Never forget that moment that you realize that you're a sinner. You realize that without Christ, there was no hope, no eternal hope in you. Now, all of our stories are different. I know from my girls, they came to know the Lord at a young age. And so when I talk to them about what it remembers to be broken, that's going to be a lot different than if I talked to Bruce this morning or some of y'all that came to the Lord later in life where you were paralyzed by something in your life. Some of us were very paralyzed. Some of y'all, it took a friend, a family member, bringing you on your mat, whatever that was, to Jesus. Maybe you were paralyzed with an addiction. Maybe you were paralyzed in a broken relationship. Maybe you were paralyzed with anger, depression, anxiety. Maybe you were paralyzed by many different sins that have overtaken your life to the point where you thought, I'm helpless. And if it wasn't for the faith of a friend or a family member, you would be stuck on your mat still, out in the world, wondering if there's any hope for you. We need to remember our brokenness. We need to remember that each and every one of us need Jesus. Apart from Him, we're broken in our sins. We're broken where we are. We're broken, we're messy, we're messed up, the whole nine yards, and that's what it is. Listen, folks, the church is a messy place. Do you know that? We're all broken. Y'all look to your left for a minute. Now look to your right. I don't know if I was doing that right. You know what you see? Mess. That person to your left, that person to your right, they're a mess. And they belong to church. We're, we, we are a messy group of people. I think I even put that up there. Too many times I think we come to church and we don't understand this. The church is a mess worth making. It just is. And I love this proverb 14. I'm not going to really spend a lot of time because I'm just going to call you all a whole bunch of ox. It's better than calling you the donkey word, okay? And I'm just letting you know. All right. Where there are no oxen, the manger is clean. Y'all didn't come to church. Let me tell you, this church has been clean for months when we couldn't meet. <laughs> you know, kind of deal. But abundant crops come from the strain of the ox. Church is a messy place, folks. It just is. 
It should be filled with oxes. It should be filled with men and women who are of the gospel, but when they tread and when they eat, they're going to make a mess. And we're going to make a mess together as a church. Is that all right with y'all? If you guys want to find a squeaky clean church, Grafton is not going to be your place. All right? It's not going to be the place that you're going to come and find a squeaky clean, lovey-dovey little church that is going to, you know, kind of be there. In fact, go to this next one here for me. That next slide. Oh, wait a minute, go back. You might have done it already. Oh, yeah. If we want to be the church, I couldn't even see it. We need to be a place that someone can bring their mess to. This is something I really want to be honest about again. We're remembering that we are broken. So that means if someone walks in that door, somebody should be able to walk in that door, and if they got a broken marriage, it should be okay. Someone walks in that door and they're an addict. They're struggling with their sexual identity. They're struggling with their gender. If they're struggling with any of the, I could give all the cliches today. Maybe they're struggling with racism. Maybe they're struggling with justice. Maybe they're struggling. I, I could go on, on and on about the mess of this world. And if they walk in that door, it should be okay. That we will love them and take care of them because we know what it means to be a mess. We will not judge them, and they shouldn't judge us, because we're just a whole bunch of ox sitting together. I'm going to slip up and say donkey here in a minute, and y'all going to just be okay with that. Yeah. Yeah. We need to be real. We need to be honest. We need to know that we are broken, healed by Christ. When someone walks in that door and says, I'm broken, I am totally broken, you can say, I've been there. Can I introduce you to the man that healed you? That's being the church. See? But it ain't going to happen if you get on your little self-righteous pedestal and think you're better than anybody else. Or you think your life is so perfect now, or so correct now, that you can't die and look and say, oh, man, mm, that's terrible. We don't like that at this church. That ain't going to be church, folks. And that's, that's not going to be the kind of church you and I are going to be the church should be where you can bring your paralyzed family, family members and friends. And it really just, it, and it shouldn't just be those who are already in church. Oh, I have a friend who hasn't found a church yet. I'm going to bring them. That's fine. But we want the broken. We do want the paralyzed. In fact, I think that's kind of what this story talks about is that the crowd was keeping the man that really needed Jesus from Jesus. Because they were all kind of getting all together. You shouldn't have to hide when you come to church your fears, your doubts, your worries when you come into church to think that we're perfect. It should be that we are broken. We're kind of like a hospital. You got a problem? Bring it to the church. And that, by the way, and I don't mean just Sunday morning, I mean any time. We need to be able to say, and I kind of give you that. Maybe some in this crowd realized what hmm. do I want to say that again? what I mean that finally let me say to go to this next slide for a minute I, I'll come to it is that while they were preaching God's word to them four men arrived carrying a paralyzed man on the mat and they couldn't bring him to Jesus because of the crowd so they dug a hole through the roof and then they lowered the man on his mat right down now stay right here Aaron, on that slide I want you to imagine this paralyzed man. I was going to bring Harvey up here and act like my little paralyzed man because he'd do good at that. He, he usually can paralyze himself on a Sunday morning real good. Um, wow. <laughs> just imagine a man who's paralyzed. Now this man, chances are, knew of Jesus, right? He's in this little small village. There's no doubt how long Jesus has been doing all this work. Can you imagine, as people were going to church day in and day out to hear Jesus preach, he might have been laying on that mat, mat going, can you take me to Jesus? Hey, y'all, I really don't have any hope. Can you take me to church? Hey, I, I'm broken over here. I just need one of y'all. Can you just carry me? I can't get to church. Can you take me? How many of you have friends and family members who don't know how to cry out, but they're crying out every week, can you take me to Jesus? 
I'm paralyzed. I can't feel nothing. I can only feel my addiction. I can only feel my pain. I can only feel my brokenness. I can only feel uh, the loneliness, the void inside of me. Can you take me to Jesus? Oh, I ain't got time to take you. That's the problem, folks. We're so used to going to church for ourselves, we forget that there's a whole heaping world out there that is broken. We need to be like Christ. You know the little parable that says the shepherd will leave the 99 to go get the one. Believe them. It's conviction on my heart. I gotta stop always worrying about my 99. Make sure that I'm a shepherd that's looking for the one. The paralyzed sheep is stuck behind a rock. Caught with the wolves getting ready to be eaten. We gotta wake up to that church. Really do. You gotta wake up that there is a whole bunch of paralyzed people out there. The only real church happening that day were those four men and that paralyzed man that I know of, that I'm reading in this story right here. Everybody else had a church that day. They were all in front of Jesus. They watched the healing. Oh, they probably praised him the whole nine yards. But really, the real church happened there. I wrote this question, and I, and I think I have it. Can y'all? Oh, yeah. Have you ever gone out of your way to pick someone up and bring them to Jesus? Now, if that steps on your toes, I'm sorry. Have you? Have you gone out of your work day, out of your life, to say, you know what? I really need to get a friend of mine to church. You know what? I got this family member who just really is an atheist. It's all they talk about. I need to introduce. They, I mean, folks, this is the people. We, we gotta be this. We gotta, we gotta ask ourselves: Do I go out of my way to make sure that some? Again, not bring them to church. Bring them to Jesus. However that works for you. A lot of us here can be church on your social media sites. You can. You can stop being about yourself. Stop always being about our community and be about Jesus. Okay? We can do that. This is something that the, the Lord gave to you this next slide, and, and it's just kind of part of where I'm at. Aaron, go to that next one for me. Uh, oh, did I miss it? Go back. Two, two, two slides for me. One? Is that two? So that I didn't put it in there. All right. The power of the church is the hand of Jesus. But the potential of the church is in the hand of the church. That's what I wanted to kind of, I wanted to put that up there because the truth is our power for someone's salvation is in the hands of Jesus, but the potential of the church is always in our hands. We're the hands and feet of Christ. It is up to us to be the people that can be the church for others around us. So later on, Jesus is going to make this very quick claim in, in, in Mark 2. I don't, I don't have it on the screen, I don't think. Those who were well had no need of a physician. But those who were sick they came not to call the righteous but the sinner. I've heard sermon after sermons of folks that would say that the church is like a hospital. It's not full of sick people. It's full of, I mean, not, it's not full of well people. It's full of sick people. But what hospital would be of any value if it didn't have ambulances? bring We need to be those ambulances, folks. We need to be able to bring people into the church so they can encounter Jesus Christ. Not encounter Pastor Dave Rice. Not to encounter a good worship band. Encounter Jesus. That takes all of us being in church when we're together. And even outside. So, number one is what? To be the church, we need to remember our brokenness. And number two would be, to be the church, we need to bring the broken to Jesus. As a church, we should always be aware of those who are paralyzed in our presence. So again, a physical ailment is easy to spot. An emotional, spiritual one, that's a little more difficult. But because social media, let me tell you, I've been able to pick out the paralyzed. 
I can see it real quick online. Who my family and friends are who are paralyzed by this world and by the sin that is around them. We shouldn't just invite Christians to church. We should be inviting those who need to be awoken to their sins, who need to see that maybe what they've been missing is that of Christ. And these are the unchurched. You don't know what the unchurched is. That's an individual that never goes to church. All right? We need to bring them. You need to, your atheistic friend, that person who's like, yeah, yeah, I know all about church, but they've never been. That's the unchurched person. There's also the dechurched. These are individuals who have been hurt, ostracized, you know, shunned in some ways, and, 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 and been put aside, and then there's the unmoved. Those who have never been impacted by the body of Christ, they're going to go, whatever, that's your crutch, I'm out of here. So the dechurched, the unchurched, the Unmoved. These are the people that you got to be looking for and bring them to Jesus. Now, I know most of y'all ain't ready, unfortunately, to really tell them about Jesus. So Sunday morning is a great way. Or maybe it is a Bible study. Or maybe it's a link to another pastor or a sermon or something that kind of opens and plants seeds in their lives. You just need to be the church and bring those paralyzed friends and family to Jesus. Because guess what? I keep seeing that hashtag, no justice what? No peace, no peace right? Y'all seen that everywhere? Well, let me tell you, the real answer is, until you know Jesus, there'll be no justice and there'll be no peace. They, this world, I, I don't know why we think our politicians will bring us peace. They won't bring peace. I don't know why we think our military, our police force will ever be, I mean, they are our peacemakers in some ways, but they won't bring peace, guys. Only Jesus can do that. Sin will always be in the heart of man. And this is not me copping out or being complacent. I'm just telling you, without Jesus, there is no peace. Because peace is not a state of mind. It is a person. It is Jesus Christ. And so unless we emulate it, Unless we go, yes, this is terrible times, this is happening, but I'm okay, I have peace. How do you have peace? I have Jesus. Well, that's easy for you to say. No, not really. That's hard for me to say. Because I understand the unrest of this world. But I'm at, I'm at peace in my heart. And that's what we need to be that way. But if the church is not bringing the broken, then we're not really being the church if we're not bringing them to Jesus. I was going to, and I want to tell you, and, I, and I'm, I'm going to wrap this up. I remember in high school, I used to do campus life. Is anybody old enough that there was campus life around Cindy and Jamie? Now, it turned over to being young life. So our young people here, if you go to high school, you probably know young life. Okay, so I did both of those ministries. But I grew up and came to the Lord through campus life. And we had these things called love groups, living unit groups, kind of like life groups. But we called them love groups. And they were living units where I learned the Bible through my mentor, Jeff Cannon. Well, there was a young lady at my school, at Kikatan High School, where I graduated in 1984, you know. Uh, a long time ago, 1984. Wow. So, but she, she got pregnant and couldn't reach out on social media to ask if I could share a story, but I know this one well. Uh, she got pregnant in 1984 at school. Now, you can imagine, even back in 1984, for a young lady, a, a teenager, she's probably all 16, maybe 17 at the most, pregnant, right? School alone was already difficult for her to, to be pregnant. At. But she would come to the love group, and she would tell the story about going to church. And finally, she told the church, you know, pray for her, she's having this baby. And unlike our church here, which would embrace that young lady, love that young lady, have a baby shower for that young lady, that church shunned her. Not only did they shun her, they shunned the parents, the family. So basically, one comment at a time, one Sunday at a time, the deacons, the elders, the leaders, the families of that church ran that young lady home. I remember her coming to a campus life meeting, and our the woman leader Beth, uh, that was kind of our main leader for for the girls, and, and 
this lady, this, this teenage girl, just crying her eyes out and said, I no longer go to church, this is my church. Because that was the only place she felt accepted. And praise God that she at least God had given her us to love her through. And man, that was the first baby shower I ever went to. I was in high school, dude, I didn't know what to do with a baby shower. You know, that age. I remember having to ask my mom, what do I do with this? What do I do with that baby? I don't know. Well, you're going to, my mom talked to me every day. I knew that. We'll never be that church for us. All right? Because we're going to remember our brokenness. We're going to remember that we need to be a church that brings those people in. I don't know if y'all know this story. How many of y'all know the story of the woman caught in, in adultery? Y'all know that story? Y'all know the story? Make sure you raise your hands. All right? Because and this is where I'll close. Jesus, I mean, if you don't know the story, here's the theory how it is. Jesus brings, well, the, the, the religious leaders of the day were trying to catch Jesus in, in him flubbing as the son of man. And so they bring out to him a woman caught in adultery. All right? And I've always thought to myself, where's the other person? Adultery takes two the last time I checked. But they only bring the woman to it. Okay, so the man hightailed it out, I don't know, but just the woman's there, right? And so all these religious leaders are there. Now, both of the religious leaders in Jesus have one thing in common. Hear me on this. They both have one thing in common. They want this woman not to sin anymore. You feel me? They both want it. They both want this woman to not sin anymore. They're just going to go about it in two different ways. The religious leaders are going to stone her to death. To get her to repent from her sins. Jesus is going to forgive her. There's a big difference for us. And so here this, this woman is in the Bible. Y'all know it well. And then when it says they bring her out. So listen, this, this woman was caught in adultery. And you know, by law we can stone her. And Jesus is kind of like, here's this poor woman. We don't know if she's naked. But he's kind of down and he's riding in the sand. Billy Graham always said this is the only sermon Jesus ever wrote. I, Right and um, we don't know what he wrote. It would be nice to know. I've heard you know different stories. He wrote the sins of these religious fanatics. But he stands up and he says, "Okay, guys, you're right. You're right. You're right. I, I can turn right to it. You know, he's called an adultery stone this morning. He goes, "You're right. You're right. The law's there." He says, "However, let me just ask you. He of you that are without sin right now, you're in the eyes of God, you go ahead and throw that first." And I don't know if Jesus stepped aside, and that poor woman must have went, oh my gosh. I mean, that poor thing. But Jesus step, steps aside, and, and historians will tell us that whoever throws the first stone is making what they call the kill shot. They get to throw that stone, they actually pick up a bigger one, and hit them on top of the head so as to knock them out. So you imagine whoever is going to be the first to do it, Better be a righteous man. Oh, they better be without sin. Okay? But we know the story well. Starting with the eldest, meaning the wisest of them. You got me. They dropped their rocks and went away. Right? Now let me tell you something. Here's where we beat the church a lot. I'm telling you, we should not throw stones at other people. However, we're not to only just drop our rocks and walk away from someone who's in sin. We need to be like Jesus. Jesus stood there, and after they were gone, Jesus asked the woman, who is left to stone you? And the woman answered, who, what? No one. And Jesus, the only person who had a right to pick up a stone and kill this woman, says, neither do I condemn you. Now go and sin no more. If we are going to be Christ-like, anytime you encounter somebody who's in sin, I'm not telling you to just drop your rock and walk away. I'm telling you to look at them and say, I understand. I don't condemn you either for what you've done. Now, let me take you to Jesus where you can sin no more. You, you, you understanding what I'm saying to you? Okay? We 
we cannot just drop our stones, walk away, turn a blind eye to the sins of our friends and family members. That does them no good. They need to encounter Jesus in such a manner that they feel the redeeming, sacrificial, loving forgiveness of our Savior. It's not for me to condemn. It's not for me to throw a rock. It is for me to introduce them to the man, the God, that can save them. Now, I promise you that that woman, I guarantee, has sinned again at some point in her life. But I guarantee you, she left that encounter with Jesus and sinned no more for a while at least. Can't say so much for those Pharisees. They probably walked away and, just, and, and, and indulged in their sins afterwards. Who knows? That encounter with Jesus changed that woman. We need to be a church of compassion. We do. We need to be a church of compassion. And so, Van, y'all can come on up here. Come on up. Let me just finish with these three little, four little things. And, and Aaron, just put them up there for me. What keeps us from being a church of compassion? I think we drop a lot of our stones and then we don't really uh, love people in Christ. And so sometimes in a church setting, I think a lot of it, I think it's got to be in you. We have a spirit of complacency. And what that means is I think there's a lot of churches that say, hey, we're just good enough. <laughs> We're good enough. We got a nice little crowd. We're doing good. Let's not stir anymore. That's not what Christ wants. Okay? On the other hand, you got a whole bunch of churches saying, we're the best. We're rocking it. And so they continue to try to outclass another church, but they ain't outclassing them in the Word of God. They're not outclassing them in, in Bible studies. They're outclassing them in secular things. Stop being complacent in the Word of God. We need to learn to be better at being Jesus to those around us. Amen? Then, the spirit of compromise. Too many of us, folks, we're sinners. We're sinners. But we compromise our faith in God over and over again. God is looking for the clean hands, the pure heart. But our Jesus, he's big enough. No matter how many times you stumble in Christ, he can't forgive you. Over and over again in the sense of that. But not only that, we are brothers and sisters, we're children of God. What we really need to do is say, God, help me in my whatever that is. Give me strength, give me power. I gotta stop compromising my walk with Christ. There's the spirit of greed, and I'm not talking about money, I'm just talking about just hoarding whatever is yours. Whatever God is giving you belongs to his glorious kingdom. We gotta use it for his glory as a church, as individuals. And then that constriction, I think way too many of us come to church asking the question, what do I get out of it? What is it? What's in it for me? What am I gonna get out of this service? What am I gonna get out of that church? And if you ain't gonna get nothing out of it, you're out the door. Why are you not asking, hey, where does this church lack and how can I plug in? How can I help you? Do you need help in your nursery? I'll, I'll be right there. I haven't really worked with kids. Someone's got to teach me how to change a diaper, but I'll love to help you. I can, I can, I can pass a background check. I can do whatever you got to do. I'll do it. I'll jump those hoops. I want to help you with kids. You do it. Hey, I see that you don't really have a young adults ministry. Can I help you with that? Can I make that happen for you? Stop living a spirit of constriction, saying, "What am I going to? What can you do for me?" We are the church. The best you have is that Jesus died for you. Now live for him. That's what you got to do. That's being the church. And then to go to that last, last slide. We're back to this one. If we're going to be the church, folks, we're going to be it. I'm going to walk out of the camera's eye. Hey. Oh, you can't. Oh, that's a terrible slide there. It's just a, we need to remember our brokenness and we need to bring the brokenness. Stand with me this morning as we let's sing one last song together. Can you remember that today? Let's be the church from our young people to our old. Nobody's older than not compared to Methuselah. <laughs> Father God, I pray right now that some of this somehow would come to our heart and we would understand that we need to be the church. 
We need to remember our brokenness and humbly come before you and praise you and thank you that you died for us, that you rose and conquered the grave for us, and that you're preparing a home for us. And Lord, that our job now is to be the church to those around us that are paralyzed by the sins of this world, by the sins of the flesh, and that we need to love with compassion, that we need to love with a sense of no judgment, no prejudice. We come to love, just as you do. Neither do we condemn, go and sin no more. And when they come to you, God, we got to bring them to you, Lord. May our hearts be convicted and we can go and tell, disciple, praise you and love you, Lord. May we be men and women of that this very day. We give that to you in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. amen. If you need prayer this morning, we are up here. I don't have a mask, so if you come to me, but Lanny does and Lisa does if you need prayer this morning.
what day that will be. But we have to do our part now to convict our hearts, encourage our hearts, that we can do your glorious work in our kingdom right here on earth. We give that to you now. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 Have a blessed day.